This is Detour, the best stories in black travel. Peace, beautiful people. Come journey with me around the world as I shine a light on stories about music, community, and resistance. This is Excursions with Gina Arias. In our last episode, we were in the Dominican Republic with Fred One's mom, Fabiola, whose application to become a permanent legal resident of the United States was emphatically denied due to her involvement in the leftist revolutionary movement. Problem was, she had already begun establishing permanent roots in the United States. She had given birth to Fred Ones there, and she was employed at Exxon, using her sister's falsified passport as documentation. As far as Exxon knew, Fabiola had traveled to the Dominican Republic for her father's funeral. Remember, she already had graduated as a chemical engineer, so she was working for Exxon Research and Engineering. In New York. In New Jersey, New Jersey. So they said, why don't you come back? And I tried tell him, well, her father passed away and she very overwhelmed. She couldn't come or whatever. Now, a plan had to be hatched to get Fabiola back into the U.S. It was decided that Fabiola would travel to Mexico. There, she would meet with an American man who would give her the doctored passport of a United States citizen, a Puerto Rican woman who had entered Mexico previously. Only Fabiola's name and photo would be accurate on the document. Getting out of Mexico and on a flight to Chicago should be no problem. But the plan had a snag almost immediately when the plane to Mexico unexpectedly stopped in Nicaragua. Upon deplaning there, the Nicaraguan authorities detained her, stating that she had no legal right to be in Nicaragua. Unable to communicate easily with her co-planners about what was happening and realizing she would miss her connection to the man who had her new papers, anxieties ran high for everyone trying to get her back to the U.S. Eventually, the authorities let her get back on the plane, headed to Mexico, and she was again on her way. When she went to Mexico, the guy was waiting for her there. This guy was ready now on which plane she was coming. When he came... He did follow me. He gave her the paper. With her paperwork and new identity, she was able to board a flight to Chicago. And without even bothering to pick up her luggage from baggage claims, promptly caught a flight to New York City. This well-organized odyssey, managed without cell phones or emails, allowed her to reunite with her family and restart the life she had begun to make in New York City, this time as Puerto Rican Fabiola. As a young child, my partner Fred Wands was instructed to tell people that his mother was Puerto Rican, if anyone asked. We pretend that we don't want nothing to do with Dominica. We don't want to hear Dominican music, because you don't want to be discovered. Meanwhile, also back in New York City, my mom continued working at her factory job. Upon retirement in her later years, she received a small pension from her employer. Imagine that. A factory job with a decent salary and pension benefits where she belonged to a union. These were the old days when manufacturing jobs could provide a living wage and security for a family. Still, I always marveled at why she, a college-educated woman, would stay for 10 years in a job where she had to stand for eight hours ironing ties. I was making good money. I was making good money. But that eventually ended. Following the trend of deindustrialization of U.S. urban centers, the factory left New York City for cheaper, greener pastures. This disinvestment was happening while New York City was on the brink of bankruptcy and experiencing a heroin epidemic that was ravaging black and brown communities. Like Damon, the company my mother was employed at, we left New York as well. We moved to the suburbs of Long Island, myself, my mother, my stepfather Mark, who was an Armenian immigrant by way of Turkey, who always treated me as his own. I have clear memories of him helping me to get ready for school and asking me if I wanted him to fix my hair in two pigtails or one ponytail. 
And so we moved our hodgepodge family, full of love as it was. But why to Long Island? Because you're lo- looking for a place, for a better place for you. What was wrong with Queens? There was nothing wrong about the, but the, I mean, but there was getting very crowded, number one. Um, crime was high at that time. Okay. They killed people there in, uh, in Queens and Corona and stuff, you know. Just trying to rob them? Um, no, there was like gangs and racism. I, I was able to sense that too over there. Italians and, uh, you know, against Hispanics and stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. So that was. So we decided to move to Long Island. I would have thought that fleeing the city for the suburbs, at least because of racism, would be like jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire. Didn't she come up against even more racism in Long Island? No. I did not. I wasn't aware of anything like that. Right. Mm-mm. I did not. I made a lot of friends. I was accepted by everybody. My mom, although she speaks with an accent, is a light-skinned Dominican woman. This, undoubtedly, gave her easier passage in the working-class white community on the south shore of Long Island, where we settled. You know, maybe I didn't pay attention, but I don't exactly remember having any any kind of difficulty because, like, I came to Long Island and, see, I believe that maybe you felt more than me as a child, but I didn't realize that because you, you can feel it maybe, you know, but I... No one ever expressed anything different to, to me. And since you, especially when you were a teenager, you were able to click so well with everybody else. And you know that everybody loved you. So, but maybe deep inside you felt something that you were different. I didn't because I always felt that I had friends. So, I was lucky in that sense. I don't know. She's 100% correct about how my experience was very different from hers. I did have friends, but I also always felt like I didn't really belong. I was constantly asked the then in vogue question, what are you? And made to feel different and often less than. On the other hand, my family in the Dominican Republic, where I spent every one of my joyous childhood summers, considered me American, not Dominican. But all of that and the issues it raised for me is for another episode. In any case, my mom, as always, had an answer for why I was repeatedly asked that question. But the reason why they ask you, what are you, is because you were not blonde, blue eyes. Right, right. And so. most of people, especially in Long Island, right. you know? Yeah. So me, they didn't have to ask because they heard my accent. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever feel that people, you know, maybe discriminated against you once they heard your your accent or were there ever any situations? Some there? places, mm-hmm. some places, but I put them right back on their place. <laughs> How'd you do that? I, you know, I let them know that um, some, I, I remember telling someone because I have an accent, that means that I know another language. So that means I have an advantage over you. During the same time period that we were living our complex diasporic lives in Long Island, Fred One's parents landed engineering jobs with a firm that required them to make moves from New York City as well. Of all places, to Decatur, Alabama. Their white hippie friends who were classmates from Pratt were so concerned that they accompanied them on the drive down south. Fred One's parents in those days were rocking afros and were visibly black. But down in Alabama, they experienced the othering that white people in the United States sometimes do with black people who emigrate here. When we was looking for, for, an, for an apartment or house, I said, I want to go into a neighborhood that's integrated. And the lady said, but you, know, no, you are no nigger, so don't worry about it. You hear what you said? That the, lady, the lady, the real estate lady, nicely. You said that right to your face. Said, you are no nigger, so don't worry about that. No problem, so we live in a white people 
neighborhood completely. Okay, everybody was friends on that. Those people from the Dominican Republic, but you you could feel it. Feel it and experience it. It was the first time that young Fred Ones ever heard the word nigger. It was hurled at him, barely seven years old at the time, while he was walking home from school. The real estate broker might have wanted to set them apart as different from African Americans, but certainly some of the neighbors were not up for sharing their community with black people, no matter which part of the diaspora they came from. In Alabama and Decatur, the black people live in this side. You know how they divide the door part of the Decatur city? They had a train line. This side is the black, this side is the white people. That's why we don't want to be, I don't want to be there. I said, no, I can stay here. So the family was once again on the move. Fabiola and Big Freddy were relocated by Monsanto, the company they worked for by then, to Missouri. This time they lived in a more diverse neighborhood called Blackjack in the city of St. Louis. So we went to St. Louis, we saw a baseball field, baseball stadium, and we saw more black people in the city. I said, okay, here is different. Yeah, but how welcoming were white people in St. Louis? They were, they were friendly because they were, one that I was, uh, what church were they from? Uh, Mormon. They used to come over here, uh, helping Fabiola how to make uh, soup. It was a different environment. It was a different type of white people. So you felt better in, in St. Louis? Oh, super better. Life in the Midwest was better for them. Until it wasn't. Big Freddie and Fabiola separated after merely three years in Missouri. It was a painful divorce that included Fabiola running away with the children to try to get away from Big Freddie's volatility. Twice. After the drama between Freddie's parents died down, though, Big Freddie adjusted to single life splendidly. Oh, the best life. <laughs> even even after, after when I ended the relationship with my wife, because there was, wasn't many Dominicans. So for the woman, have a Dominican man, there was a party. It was special. <laughs> was special. <laughs> I don't want to leave San Luis until I got, lost my job. And that, they, they made a line to get see Freddie. Oh, and to, the, to the point that one want to kill me one time. A Ooh. woman wanted to kill me, and then I... Who wanted to kill you? A, a, lady. a lady fly at Because I told a guy, a friend of mine, uh, I want to, I wanna, now I want to be like a black woman, man. And by black, he meant African-American. It seems that a different type of othering was happening all around. Big Freddy exoticized African-American women, and vice versa. They gave me a girl that was a fly attendant. And I said, for matter of fact, I like fly attendant. She was crazy. She came over, we stayed together one night, whatever, that, but she was flying to uh, Seattle. They there three days, and she come in, and she coming back to St. Louis. And I was sick, I had a call, I said, she come and she saw the Lemba Airport, she said, Freddy, I'm here. So, are you, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine. You took your medication? I said, I took my medication. Do you took your medication? I said, I said to you that I took my medication. Are you cursing back to me? I'm gonna go over there and kick your ass. And she said that. As it happened, she was already on her way to his apartment. To get into my apartment complex, you had to go through a main gate and ask, where's Freddy's approval uh, complex? And it was, it was a couple of people. He, his lady told him that she saw on the woman back, was pulling out a, a, a gun pistol. So he called me, said, listen, the lady, is a lady here looking for you. Uh, but my, my wife said that she saw her gone. Should I give you your apartment? I said, no, <laughs> don't give it to her. Because she tried to kill a baseball player one time. So I don't know what to do. I went and get my, my little Honda, and I drove to his brother. And I, I drove to her, I said, yo, it's a woman. It's a woman who want to kill me. And she said, huh, what, what do you mean a woman want to kill you? But why do she want to kill you? Do you have anything? <laughs> do you have anything with her? No, I don't know what she want to kill me. Big Freddy decided it was time to involve the state. And I called the police and I explained the police the situation with a woman. And he said, "Okay, get a gun. Watch yourself, get a gun. And if she come over, shoot it. If you kill it, 
break the glass. This is exactly what he said. Break the glass, pull it in, that she, she tried to kill you. So a cop advised him to get a gun for protection from a woman, and if she came to his apartment and he killed her, to stage the crime scene. Wow. But get a gun was exactly what he did. I never in my, work, my life used a gun. So we started shooting in the basement to learn how to do that, put my pistol, and I went back to my thing in case that she came back. She never came back. Hey, John. Big Freddy narrowly escaped death at the hands of a crazy lover. Unrelated to that incident, he settled back in the Bronx after becoming unemployed. The divorce had left him reeling, affecting his performance at work and causing him to lose his structural engineering job. He struggled to find work, but then landed a social services position with the New York City ACS, the Administration for Children's Services. During this period, Big Freddy became father to a daughter named Angelina. Later, he remarried and became father to two more daughters, Alfani and Alessandra, and helped to raise a stepdaughter, Loriette. During his life, he had navigated many immigration trials and tribulations, and now he put this knowledge of the process to good use. On the side, Big Freddy worked with immigrants to help them navigate their new lives in the U.S. through his involvement in a community-based organization in Washington Heights, the upper Manhattan neighborhood that is a mecca of Dominican culture. After working at ACS for 31 years, he retired in November of 2021. He is active at the Interdenominational Times Square Church, where he has been a member since 1990. Big Freddy is greatly admired by his many friends and fellow church members. He is well-loved by his daughters and his only son, Fred Ones, with whom he has always maintained a very close relationship. Big Freddy is considering dividing his retirement years between the Bronx and the Dominican Republic. Some rest and relaxation is well-deserved after all of his contributions to U.S. society. Similarly, my mother went through her own divorce, but soon remarried Sal, an Italian-American by way of Brooklyn, my little sister Anna Marie's biological father. He also always treated me as his own. We all grieved heavily when he passed away suddenly at the close of 1992 due to cryptogenous cirrhosis, the name for cirrhosis of the liver that is the result of unknown causes. We buried him on New Year's Eve. Those were very heavy days. After three decades of building a life in the U.S., in 1999, at the age of 53, my mother grabbed up the opportunity for early retirement that was being offered up by the Suffolk County Department of Social Services, where she had worked in various positions for over 14 years. Her and Anna Marie moved to the Dominican Republic to start a new chapter. And I had that uh, dream that it was going to be like the old times. And it wasn't. It was a different country. Yeah, it's changed a lot of changes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What would you say is the biggest change? The crime that escalated a lot. And people cannot walk the streets like I used to do when I was a young girl. And that was too much. Yeah. You got to close your doors at night and be scared. You don't know what's going to happen because you don't know if anybody's going to break in. The dream that held so much hope began to feel disappointing and she started to question her decision to go back to her country of birth. That was funny because after I went there the first five years, I was like, did I do the right thing? Then I said, "Mm, I I think I want to go back, but didn't say anything. One day we were sitting there, and Anna Marie said, "Ah, we should go back to New York. I said, Really? (laughs) Yes, let's go. (laughs) Since returning to the U.S., my mother has said that here is where she will be until her dying day and that we should bury her in the United States, not in the Dominican Republic. I guess that makes sense. 
The fact is, she's lived in this country longer than she did in her home country. She birthed and raised her children here, including one stepson, a bonus child, Donald. She has spent the better part of half a century contributing enormously, both socially and financially, to this country. In 1993, she was the subject of a Long Island Newsday article touting her high level of skill and intuition as a child protective services caseworker. Of course, she faced the typical immigrant challenges and pains. But through it all, she lent many helping hands to numerous people, both in the U.S. and in the Dominican Republic, which she continues to do to this day. At the age of 60, she remarried Ricky, who emigrated from Puerto Rico as a teenager. He is a generous and heart-centered man who we all consider to be a blessing in our lives. Oh, and at the age of 73, she took up swimming lessons and finally learned to swim. Growing up, my mom's response to the question, ¿Cómo tú estás? How are you? in Dominican, was invariably, aquí en la lucha, here in the struggle. I can't ever know the depth and contours of all of her struggles, but I have borne witness to how brilliantly she navigated every single one. The same brilliant navigation can absolutely be said for Fabiola. After her separation from Big Freddy, she continued a steep trajectory of career success, landing bigger and better jobs in large corporations such as DuPont and Pepsi. These were no easy gigs. The white men that she supervised continually repudiated an immigrant manager, a woman with a heavy accent. Yet, she continued to climb the corporate ladder, moving around the country with her children, from St. Louis to Virginia, Delaware, DC, and Maryland. These moves were big moves professionally, but they also had a downside. Young Fred Ones attended 10 different schools in four different states before college. It seems that Fabiola was constantly running from place to place in an effort, perhaps, to avoid recognition. She even took up long distance running, completing various marathons. She baked her own bread, was renowned in her family as an extraordinarily kind and intelligent woman and an amazing cook to boot. Fabiola's large home, no matter which state it was in, like my childhood home, was always the one that the extended family came to for major holidays and gatherings. I remember one time she called me and she said, I need to talk to you. I said, no, 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 I don't want to hear nothing, Fabiola. I want to hear nothing to tell me about Freddie. Or... No, no, no. Is the, that they find out that I have a, a malignant tumor that was the thing that with the cancer. So I switched there and I gave a lot of support after that. Tragically, on March 7, 1997, Fabiola succumbed to cancer, as had her younger brother Franklin and older sister Carmen before her. She waged a valiant fight against this dreadful disease but for all of the courageous struggling and life-preserving fleeing that she had done throughout her life, this was the one thing that she could not escape. She was the greatest woman that I ever had. Because of the personality, the kind of person that she she was, uh, very, very honest, very dedicated, uh, hard worker, very intelligent, by the way. And a lot, a lot of the, the definition that can qualify somebody as excellent, she has. She had returned to the Dominican Republic in her final days and died on her 50th birthday. She was buried in her home country. Fabiola Perdomo continues to be deeply missed by all of her family, particularly by her children. Fred Wunz and I are just two of thousands of children born to parents who were part of an early wave of Dominicans that came to New York in the 1970s. 
our parents were spurred to emigrate due to repressive political realities and dead-end economic conditions within the Dominican Republic. For my mom, an oppressive home life was also a driver to come to the U.S. Although the landmark 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act was key to opening up more pathways for greater amounts of immigrants to come to the United States, the hand that the U.S. government had in shaping geopolitics and helping to fuel large waves of immigration cannot be overlooked as to why we came to be birthed here. Because Trujillo and Balaguer were cut from the same cloth, both conservative strongmen keen on terrorizing the populace into submission and murdering dissidents, the U.S. government allowed them to flourish. As long as they were not left-wing governments, the U.S. kept out of sight. Both the 1916 and 1965 invasions and occupations of the Dominican Republic by U.S. military forces, rather than foment democracy, laid the foundation for corrupt and oppressive regimes to seize and maintain power. And although there was tremendous resistance to those regimes from some of our own family members as we came to learn, one of the consequences of the entirely anti-democratic conditions in the Dominican Republic included an almost palpable pressure to leave the country. The promise of a better life, something that all immigrants are nourished by, was realized by our parents, even if the longing for their homeland never truly subsided. They grappled with many of the same struggles faced by other immigrants and maintained a laser-sharp focus on making good on their decision to emigrate by building a good life for themselves and their children. There were plenty of sacrifices that came with their choices, but they did not throw in the towel ever. Our parents planted firm roots here that continued to dig even deeper into U.S. soil, with now a second generation being birthed here, Fred One's children and my son. We all owe them a debt of gratitude for the example of parenthood and personhood that they provided. And, if we can be so bold, we'll say that the United States is all the better for their decision to come to this country. As of 2018, there were approximately 2 million people of Dominican descent in the United States, making this group the fifth largest of Latinx people in the U.S. This two-part episode of Excursions tells only a small part of the many stories in our community. We lovingly dedicate Excursions Dominican Republic edition to Freddie and Guido's mother, the incomparable Fabiola Perdomo. Our wholehearted thanks to my mother, Nelly Margarita Arias, and Fred One's family members, his father, Freddy Rafael Sepúlveda, his brother, Guido Perdomo, his aunt, Clarisa del Prado, his cousins, Yvette Acevedo and Eddie del Prado, and lifelong family friend, Magalis Camacho. Audio engineering and sound design was provided by Fred Wunz. This is a listener-sponsored program. We welcome you to join us in these efforts to tell our stories of music, community, and resistance by dropping some coins in the virtual hat via Zelle to onexcursions at gmail.com. That's O-N-E-X-C-U-R-S-I-O-N-S at gmail.com. Thank you in advance. This has been a Fred One Arts and Baby G production. Peace! Peace.